Folk psychology, the starting point. Folk psychology comprises the everyday intuitive theory of psychology which people instinctively employ when interacting with each other. Whenever we try to think about consciousness, either individually or collectively, we are initially going to be trapped within this particular set of concepts. This entrapment within an intuitive conceptual system is true of the study of consciousness in a way that's not true of any other research topic. Folk psychology can be called the starting place for thinking about consciousness for the following reasons. If randomly asked for their ideas about consciousness, folk psychology is the framework of concepts within which the average person who has never seriously thought about or studied the subject would begin their reflections. Folk psychology also stands for the sociocultural, historical, traditional, conceptual framework within which communities, cultures, societies and civilizations deliberate and theorize about consciousness. In addition, many of the concepts of folk psychology have an evolutionary, hardwired quality. So what does folk psychology have to say about mind and consciousness? Firstly, perhaps, is the notion that the individual's consciousness has full and complete access to that individual's own mind. In other words, everything in the mind can and possibly has been in consciousness and that there are no areas of the mind which cannot be easily explored and fully comprehended by that individual's consciousness. Another way of putting this is to say that each individual's consciousness is certain of its own mind. It has privileged access to it, and knows better than any, any other observer what's going on in it. Another defining principle of folk psychology is the notion of the autonomous conscious will. Each individual consciousness is fully aware of and in control of all the behavior emanating from his, her, mind and body. Key to this notion is the idea of the fully competent autonomous self with completely adequate information to be the causal source of all actions emanating from the mind and body. This self is morally responsible for the thoughts produced by its mind and the behavior produced by its body. Daniel Dennett has devised a metaphor called the Cartesian theater to represent this key idea in folk psychology. This picture illustrates the Cartesian theater. As you can see, the idea is that all incoming sensory information is fed to a single control center in the brain where the self can perceive it. Having thus become informed as to what's going on in the environment, the self then issues commands to the body as to what to do. Whether or not the Cartesian theater is an accurate model, it's certainly true that people generally tend to believe and feel that this is the way in which their bodies and minds interact. Daniel Wigner has suggested that 
even if the conscious will is an illusion, we believe in it because we experience an emotion of authorship when we are in the process of carrying out an action. Folk psychology's two halves. I want to suggest here that folk psychology is, in fact, a composite composed of two distinct parts. The first of these is evolutionary psychology. In other words, the mental organs and other brain structures we have evolved in order especially to relate to and interact with other individuals in our highly social species. The other half of folk psychology consists of what I'm calling here ethno-psychology. While clearly based in evolutionary psychology, this is a cultural construct emerging following the advent of language from the memes accumulated by each and all cultural groups. All ethno-psychologies inevitably include theories about mind and consciousness. Our ethno-psychology, since the emergence of the modern Western world, is Cartesianism which went virtually unchallenged until around a hundred years ago. Much of the confusion and difficulty of extracting folk psychology from contemporary consciousness research is, I believe, this merger of a cultural product with a set of instinctual predispositions and attitudes. The Uses of Evolutionary Psychology As the name implies, the theory of evolutionary psychology assumes that it emerged to fulfill a set of biological functions within our species. We can now look at the sorts of benefits that have been claimed in this area. Firstly, the deeply rooted conviction that our behavior and the behavior of others is driven by conscious mental states such as fear, anger, desire, etc. provides a context within which we can a. reflect on and comprehend our own behavior and b. try to predict and respond to the behavior of others. A byproduct of this, as Nicholas Humphrey has suggested, is that we can project our understanding of folk psychology onto other people and thus have a sense of and apparent insight into the mental and emotional lives of others. This provides an everyday solution to the philosophical problem of other minds. The relatively simple and familiar categories of folk psychology greatly assist everyday communication and understanding between human beings. This is sharply illustrated, as we shall see later on, if we try to replace folk psychological terminology with that of, for example, neuroscience. And in fact, if we did seriously abandon folk psychology, the probability is that we would become deeply alienated from the lived human world and fail to understand both ourselves and others. Finally, the terminology and categories of folk psychology are deeply embedded in our languages, attitudes and cultures. To take just two core examples, Shakespeare and the Bible – 
are cram full of folk psychological projections and analysis. The origins of ethnopsychology. Turning now to ethnopsychology, and given that it is a cultural construct, we need to inquire into its origins, especially in our own Western mental worldview. Gilbert Ryle suggested in the late 1940s that Cartesianism was the official doctrine of Western society. John Maynard Keynes probably meant much the same thing when he said that the common sense of the man in the street was based on the work of a philosopher 300 years earlier. Cartesianism in turn, has deeper roots. Much of Descartes' thought about the soul and the existence of an ideal world outside of space and time can be traced back to Plato. While his downgrading of the material half of the world was deeply influenced by Christian creator god monotheistic theology. This monotheistic approach literally adopts the perspective which Thomas Nagel characterized as the view from nowhere. Specifically, the idea that the single creator God drained all energy and innovation out of matter, leaving it passive and inert, only capable of being affected by external forces. Descartes himself interwove these deep earlier cultural influences into the common human base of evolutionary psychology in order to articulate what has become the official modern Western doctrine on mind and consciousness. Descartes split the world into a material half, res extensa, and a mental or spiritual part, res cogitans. Res extensa was purely material and mechanical, just like the emerging early modern science of his time. By splitting this off from the spiritual domain, the material world could, could safely be left for science to study, while res cogitans was the province of the church. This division, therefore, could reduce the conflict between science and religion by allowing science free reign in the material world while reserving the mental spiritual world to religion. The big problem with Descartes' system was his insistence that the mental and physical worlds interact with each other. He recognised, along with Leibniz and others, that exactly how this interaction was supposed to work was a very challenging question. Descartes' suggestion that this interaction takes place via the pineal gland, mainly because it's a single organ in the centre of the brain, was not very convincing. Modernism, undermining folk psychology. From the 19th century onwards, modern science and philosophy has begun to systematically undermine and erode folk psychology. The first onslaught came when 19th century physicists began to accept the doctrine of the physical closure of the material world. In other words, all physical events have a material cause – 
which in turn also had a material cause, and so on in an endless chain. These causal chains allow no space for non-material causes, such as those from res, res cogitans, to intervene in the causal process. Next, in the early 1900s, and following the failure of introspective psychology, behaviorism emerged, first in psychology and later in philosophy. Behaviorism, as the name implies, concentrated solely on behavior and literally denied the existence of mind and consciousness. Finally, in the late 1940s and 50s, identity theory emerged in philosophy. Rather than simply denying the existence of mental states, as behaviorism did, identity theory stated that mental states are brain states. They are one and the same thing. This was clearly a very radical rejection of Descartes' split world. But the hard problem remains. However, the hard problem stubbornly refused to go away. This phrase, the hard problem, was coined by David Chalmers in the 1990s. A good illustration of the hard problem was devised by John Heal. It goes like this. Imagine you're watching a very spectacular firework display. While you're doing this, imagine also that a third party has complete transparent access to your brain. This observer would not find any vivid, colorful flashes or loud bangs and whizzes in the gray and white matter of your brain. In other words, the phenomenal experience you are having when watching the fireworks or anything else is simply not available to objective scientific observation as we understand it today. This is the hard problem. Responding to the demise of folk psychology. Cartesianism has no problem with the hard problem. According to it, your phenomenal experience takes place in your private mind, which is located in res cogitans. And given that res cogitans is a mental and spiritual realm which exists outside of space and time, your phenomenal experience is not and never will be accessible to investigation by science. However, once Western culture began to question Cartesianism, the hard problem came into existence. Scientists and philosophers have responded to the hard problem in five basic ways. The first has been simple denial. Behaviorists, both psychological and philosophical, have simply denied that mental states and propositional attitudes exist, or in a milder version, have claimed that consciousness is an epiphenomenal delusion, meaning that we misinterpret mental states as causal and therefore overvalue the importance of these states. Secondly, particularly neuroscientists adopted a fundamentalist reductive position. Here, mental states if they exist at all, are simply part of the physical world and based entirely on material, mechanical processes.
from the point of view of fundamentalist reductionism, all talk about consciousness is epiphenomenalist. In other words, consciousness is an unimportant byproduct of the operation of the nervous system. Like the whistle from a steam train, it may be noticeable but has no causal effects on the operations of the machine. A third response can be called normal science. The idea here is that consciousness does not really present an insoluble problem to the sort of science we have today. In this context, an analogy is often made with vitalism. Up to the end of the 19th century, it was still an open question as to whether the difference between living and non-living things could be reduced to differences in material structures and processes, or whether some vital essence or spirit was required. Our contemporary scientific establishment now regards this question as decisively settled against vitalism, and many within this establishment consider that consciousness will go down the same route. What they mean by this is that the scientific paradigms we have now, without drastically changing their assumptions, will be able to accommodate an effective and convincing physiochemical explanation of consciousness. The fourth response specifically contradicts this. A minority of leading scientists, for example, Roger Penrose, believe that contemporary science will have to undergo dramatic paradigm shifts in order to explain consciousness. The shifts will be on a par with those experienced in 20th century physics in connection with relativity theory and quantum mechanics. Those who believe this generally also believe that the explanation for consciousness will eventually come from one of the new sciences, such as quantum mechanics, chaos theory, or nonlinear system dynamics. Finally, a fifth response to the decline of folk psychology has been Mysterianism. This comes in two versions. First, believers in the traditional faith groups who simply insist on the spiritual aspects of folk psychology and are not willing to consider any scientific evidence which contradicts these. Secondly, there's a philosophical version of Mysterianism, articulated especially by Colin McGinn, which claims that the human brain, as it has evolved, is simply not capable of comprehending whatever physical or biological structures and processes underlie consciousness. A comparison is sometimes made with a fly or a frog trying to understand the world of human culture. According to the Mysterian position, consciousness is and will always remain forever a mystery. Meaning for behaviorists. As an example of both denial and reductionism, we can take behaviorism, which dominated psychology from the early to the mid 20th century and also had a major influence on the philosophy of mind. Behaviorism solved the problems of representation and intentionality by simply externalizing them. Cartesianism assumed that the mind used its divine capacity for reason, 
to transform physical sensations into clear, distinct, and meaningful ideas. In other words, meaning was a product of the spiritual powers of the mind and was apprehended and comprehended internally within the mind. The early Wittgenstein, as a spokesperson for philosophical behaviorism, radically rejected the Cartesian view. He resisted any notion of an internal or mental meaning for symbols, such as words, rather than having some sort of abstract meaning in the mind, the significance of words was determined by the way people actually used them to regulate their behavior. As an example, Wittgenstein used the word buru, which in Spanish means donkey, while in Italian it means butter. Clearly, Spaniards and Italians use this same word in completely different ways, and the behavior manifest in connection with it is obviously also radically different. Wittgenstein's point here is that there is no inherent meaning in this symbol, which can be grasped and comprehended by the mind. Rather, its entire meaning is composed by its usage plus the behavior associated with it. The Problems with Folk Psychology Given all this criticism, let's now look at the problems with folk psychology. I think that Churchland's big mistake is in treating the whole of folk psychology as a conventional scientific theory that originated with the Greeks. As above, the true picture, I believe, is more complex. The evolutionary part is more like a built-in theory, which we will inevitably use to deal with our environment especially our social environment. Unlike other theories, we can't change this any more than we can change our digestive systems. The ethno-psychology part, what Ryle called the official doctrine, is culture and epoch-bound, therefore can and does change within historic time. On the other hand, I find it unlikely that ethnopsychology will evolve into the reductive concepts of neuroscience, mainly because it will always have to be integrated with evolutionary psychology. This officially accepted ethnopsychology is ultimately grounded in the cultural worldview of particular societies. In the modern West, it has generally taken the form of Cartesianism, and this has blocked and hampered empirical research into mind and consciousness. To this extent, Churchland is right. But is this the same as saying that folk psychology as a whole is a straitjacket on the efforts of modern science to understand consciousness? From the opposite perspective, could or should contemporary scientists use folk psychology as a reliable guide for exploring mind and consciousness. As above, I believe that most of the problems involved in choosing between these alternatives arise from the fusion of ethnopsychology, especially Cartesianism, 
with our evolutionary mental equipment into what has become known as folk psychology. Clearly, the evolutionary part of folk psychology is part of the subject matter of neuroscience and consciousness studies. Ethnopsychology, on the other hand, probably is nothing but a collection of outmoded theories and should, from a scientific point of view, be dispensed with. The trouble with this is that it may prove problematic to establish exactly where the boundaries between these two components of folk psychology are located. Eliminating folk psychology. Let's now look at another concrete example of the fundamentalist reductive approach. Paul Churchland's insistence that folk psychology cannot be integrated into the emerging worldview of neuroscience, but must rather be completely eliminated. His basic argument is that folk psychology is simply a wrong and inadequate theory, like demonic possession in medieval medicine or crystal spheres supporting the stars in medieval cosmology. It has to be abolished before any real scientific progress can be made on mind and consciousness. Looking at it as a theory, Churchland says that folk psychology has a stagnant and degenerating research program. And he says that folk psychology has made no progress since the Greeks. He also claims that folk psychology as a theory fails very significantly to explain a large number of phenomena in the realm of mind and consciousness. For example, folk psychology fails to explain mental illness, imagination, differences between individuals in intelligence, and the nature of sleep and memory. Also, learning. And even such basic skills as catching a ball and constructing a three-dimensional model of the world from the two-dimensional images which impact on the retina. The reductionist tendency in neuroscience, which is still probably the majority view in the field, led to the conclusion that the theory and concepts of folk psychology will be eliminated and replaced by neuroscience terms. At the extreme, Churchland, for example, predicts that neuroscience terms will entirely replace folk psychological terms in everyday discourse. This fundamentalist position is illustrated by this quotation from David Rose. Quote, Eliminativism involves the removal of any idea of the mind, replacing it with ideas from the theory of neuroscience, couched in terms of brain states and neurophysiology. So instead of saying, I hate you, you would say something like, oh, you make cells fire in my left ventromedial amygdala. Instead of saying, I'm seeing red, you'd say, my long wave cones are overactive relative to my middle wave cones. Instead of saying, Maggie is insane, you would say Maggie has excess dopamine D2 receptors in her mesolimbic system, and so on.
we would learn a new vocabulary and a new interpretation of our minds in terms of neuroscience that would eventually replace our folk psychological terminology and provide us with a more accurate understanding. End quote. Rose Consciousness, 2006. Interestingly, many psychoanalytic and psychiatric terms, such as projection, complex, and paranoid, have entered everyday speech. But that's probably because they fit in with underlying folk psychological concepts much better than do neuroscience terms. Viving folk psychology. The big question as regards reviving folk psychology within a contemporary scientific context concerns its causal efficacy. The problem here is that this introduces the notorious debate concerning free will versus determinism. Clearly, folk psychology assumes that people are moral agents who plan, decide and choose their actions and are therefore personally responsible for their behaviour. Andy Clark claims that the causal efficacy of folk psychology is one of the most important questions in neuroscience. Within the philosophy of mind, Daniel Dennett, in direct contradiction of Churchland, argues that we should accept folk psychology in the form of what he calls the intentional stance. He believes that we have a natural tendency to see responsible agents all around us. I'll talk more about this in the next unit of the course. Jerry Fodor, from quite a different perspective, also believes in the ultimate reality of folk psychological concepts. Fodor was one of the pioneers of classical digital computational theory, and he believed that the mental states of folk psychology, such as anger, fear, deception, etc., could be simply translated into physical symbols in the brain, which are then manipulated according to the rules of the brain's software, resulting in, an outco in outcomes which are generally compatible with the predictions of folk psychology. As an example of the effectiveness of folk psychology, Fodor once commented that if you wanted to know where he was going to be tomorrow, mechanics, which is one of our best established and most advanced sciences, would not be of much help. Consistent with folk psychology, however, Fodor suggested that the most effective technique was simply to ask him. Revisiting causation. How can such flatly contradictory positions on folk psychology as those of Churchland, Dennett and Fodor have emerged? I believe that one explanation lies in different conceptions of causation. Churchland's determination to completely eliminate folk psychology from scientific discourse can, I believe, be traced back to a traditional reductive billiard ball model of causation. If all causation in the world is of this type, then indeed the concepts of folk psychology would not fit into any scientific explanation of it. However, there are other ways of looking at causation. For example, a more modern way to consider causation is 
is via the concept of supervenience. In relation to consciousness, a simple way to characterize supervenience is to say that mental states are dependent on brain states, but not determined by them. Chalmers, for example, invokes a fourfold division of supervenience. Firstly, a natural slash logical distinction, and second, a local slash global distinction. In Chalmers' complex interpretation, global supervenience is context dependent, whereas local supervenience isn't. There are other theories of causation in the field of consciousness studies, such as David Rose's multi levelism and Carl Craver's mechanistic mosaic approach, which reject simple reductionism. And the really big issue is whether there can be top down causation. In other words, whether, for example, sociological or economic forces can independently produce chemical or physical effects. This would go a long way toward overcoming the conventional objections to folk psychology and pave the way to integrating it into a scientific explanation of consciousness. So this is the end of the first unit of my course on theories of consciousness, which dealt with folk psychology. The next unit is about the effect that reductionist theories in the philosophy of science have had on efforts to understand consciousness.